Well, the, the title of the course of the, of the talk tonight is a little bit whimsical, but on the other hand, the subject really isn't. But I, we've already heard tonight the, uh, the word sustainability used a number of times, and I'd like, to, I'd like to unpack that word a bit because it has become such a buzzword. It's so popular, and it's being kind of stretched to mean lots and lots of different things. So I, I think we'll start with looking at that word and, and what it means. The, the really the classic definition that's being used a lot is in, in the phrase sustainable development, which, which the United Nations, their, their definition of it is, is sustainable development is, well, you can read exactly what's up there, but it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future to meet their own needs. And when I read something like that, the word that really jumps out at me besides sustainability on there is the word needs and the order in which these needs are given. Meet the needs of the present, and then we meet the needs of the future. I mean, how do you know? You know how do we know that meeting our own needs is going to leave enough for the future? And what is a need? You know, I think that's, that's really the, the big question there. Like, I need, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon, right? So I need my Starbucks half-calf, quarter-inch of foam, soy, chocolate sprinkles on top. You know, I mean, okay, I need that. Or, you know, okay, all right, all right, we'll be a little bit more serious <laughs> about it. When I talk to my friends who, who drive great big cars, and, you know, I know that they know better, they know what the effect of an enormous vehicle is, I ask them, okay, so, so what are you, you know, why? Why, do, why are you driving that? And they say, I need it because I run the carpool at work. You know, I need it because I have a big family. I need it because my kid's in a band and I've got to fit all of her equipment and the band members in. Or I need it because I don't feel safe in a small car with all these big cars around. So the word need is a really slippery one. I mean, how do you define what we need? You know, or, or agricultural people need large families because this is their labor force for the farm and it's their security for the future. So even though I think you know, I think we can all agree that what the planet needs is smaller families. Or we need an air conditioner because it's hot outside. So if you live in Houston or, well, anywhere that gets hot, well, we need an air conditioner because it, it's hot. So the word need is a really malleable word. And so to define sustainability in terms of meeting needs, I, I don't like where that goes. I don't like the leeway that it gives us to say, well, this is what we need, and now the future gets to meet its own needs after we're done meeting ours. So I'd like to think of sustainability in a little different way. That I think of sustainable as the midpoint between things that are degenerative, in other words, things that break things down, things that pollute, things that destroy, things that damage, which is most of well, many of our activities. A midpoint between degenerative actions and regenerative activities. And nature, of course, is the ultimate model of regenerative, things that make things better for their having been there. And sustainable is simply the middle. You know, sustainable, another way of thinking of that is that it's something you can continue to do it indefinitely given the resources that are available. I guess that's really the typical operating definition of sustainable. But because we are in the degenerative side of things so much, we really need to be moving from sustainable to regenerative activities. I mean, sustainable, it's not all that great. You know, it just means you do it over and over again. If, if someone said, how's your marriage? And you say, oh, it's sustainable. <laughs> okay? I mean, that, it's not all that good. It's really not. So it's what we're shooting for. You know, we're shooting for sustainable, but we really need to be thinking much, much further. So I'd, I'd like to look in terms of regenerative activities, and in the second part of the talk, we'll, we'll be going there. <coughs> Pardon me. So I want to give you the trajectory of the talk, just to warn you. I'm going to go to a pretty doom and gloom place for part of this, all right? But I'm going to come back out. So about the time that you're ready to sort of slit your wrists or leave in disgust or something like that, just remember that I will be coming back from, from where I am, from that 
sort of sad, <laughs> depressing place. So another way to look at sustainability is uh, the time frame. You know, if we get to do it over and over again, you know, life is 3.8 billion years. I think it's figured out how to be pretty sustainable. We've been around, I mean, human beings have been around for not really all that long. We're a pretty young species, and we don't really know what, what sustainability means. I mean, when someone says they have a sustainable farm, you know, has your farm been around 5,000 years, you know, or 10,000, or a million, or a billion? It, it hasn't. We don't, we don't really know what that means. So, so the time frame is really important. And I guess what I'd like to figure out is, okay, how long have we been human and can we kind of double that or triple that period of time to get us out to, you know, really what is, what is sustainable? So I want to ask the question, how, how long have we been human? You know, how old is our culture? And so a way to think of this, I realize I left my prop over in my briefcase, so let me grab that. So how old is human culture? And the way that I want to give a, an illustration of that is this looks like a ball of yarn. It is actually a time machine. Now, permaculture people use low-tech solutions. This is, this is a, a time machine that's made out of a ball of yarn. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back through the history of human culture. First, we need to figure out how old human culture is. And one way of thinking about it is tool making. It's a, you know, kind of, I mean, other, there are other animals that make tools, but the making of the first tools occurred about two million years ago or so. So all right, so that's one hallmark of being human, going back about two million years. Uh, another is fire, which is at least a half a million years old, maybe 800,000 or so. So that's you know, another indicator of human culture. And then just looking at the human lineage, when the genus Homo first showed up, according to the anthropologists, that's between a million and two million years ago. So I'm going to take kind of a, cons a relatively conservative number off of that and say that we've been human for a million years or so. We've been doing things that we would all recognize, making tools, building fires, that sort of thing, for about a million years or so. So this ball of yarn is 100 feet long, and I want it to represent a million years. In other words, each foot is 10,000 years. Going back 10,000 years, each inch then would be about 800 years or so. A human generation would be just a skinny little sliver. It's a lot of human generations. So what I'm going to do is ask you to start passing this ball. I think maybe if we can start passing it backwards and then wrap around the room. We'll see how, how long a million years is. So I'm going to hand this to Will. And if you would just pass it around and we'll move it around the room. And what I'm going to do is talk about human activities, the things that make us human while that's going around. This is how long we have been doing things like, you know, building baskets, sitting around weaving, doing art, artisanal technologies, crafts and, and artistic things like that, making baskets. We're still doing that. We've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years, sitting in groups, making things. I would say that sort of communal activity is a, a really essential uh, part of human culture. We've been making music for an enormously long time. You know, I'm sure the human voice has been used musically as long as we've been talking. So we've got, we've got that as an important element of human culture. We've got art. You know, even though these cave paintings from Lascaux are about 40 or 50,000 years old, you can, you know, there are carvings that are much older than that. You can bet that people have been doing art for a very, very long time. This is all in our bones here. 10,000 years at a, at a shot. So I guess another way of thinking about this is the distance between you and the person next to you is about 30,000 years. That many human generations, lots and lots and lots of them. Other things that we've been doing, you know, making shelter, you know, living in shelters for an immensely long portion of that million years for sure. And we're still doing communal shelter building. So that's an activity that's deep in our genes, deep in our bones. Know, things like that that make us human. So where's that ball? It's going about halfway back in the room now, still wandering around. Food, of course, food gathering, food production, another really, as I'm going to describe later, a fundamental piece of human culture that actually defines who we are in a lot of ways. So here we go back to a million years. We're not, still got a ways for it to go, working its way backwards. Why don't we push it backwards a little bit further? 
So a million years is a long time, right? And we've been raising children for that million years and much longer. Activities you know, that, that you can think of as definably really de shaping us. So this is a really, really, really long time, okay? And that ball of yarn is still going around, so I gotta talk for a little bit longer about the length <laughs> of human culture, right? This is feeling like a million years, isn't it? The thing about it is, okay, this is a million years of human culture. Here is the dawn of agriculture, all right? Right here, this is the beginning of agriculture. And yet we really consider agriculture, farming, to be the halt, well, it's the beginning of civilization, but it's not the beginning of being human. All these things that make, all the things of culture, you know, shelter, food, art, music, raising kids together, all of that's much, much, much deeper in our bones than agriculture. Here is written history at the end of that, and then the industrial era would be this teeny little, teeny little bit right on the edge of it. So, that's an, this is an idea that I want to kind of knock out of our heads tonight, is that agriculture is not, the whole thing of civilization is not what makes us human. It's a gloss on this at least 990,000 years of, of human history. And there is the end of the ball of yarn, way back there. So it's taken this long to get around. So there's our million years. This is actually a little bondage game. I'm kind of tying up the whole audience here, really. I can say that in this part of the country, right? In California, you don't know where, where we are. So. Okay, good. So, uh, but here it is. This is agriculture. It does not define us. Civilization is just a little gloss on this enormous piece of human history, right? Okay, so I guess we could roll up that ball of yarn from back there. Now, now I want my time machine back. I've got a patent on it, and I've got to carry it with me. So. Okay, great. Thank you. So really, oh, that, that's, that's one of the big messages here. So anthropologists divide human culture up, well, one way to divide it is, is five different human cultures based on the way we get our food. See, there are a lot, and if you look at the, the basic needs, you know, the, the uh, food, shelter, and reproduction, kind of the basic functions of, of, an, an or, of well, a human, for throwing the shelter in there, shelter is something, you build shelter and it lasts for 10 years or 30 years or whatever, we don't need to do it very often. It doesn't really define us as, as or do, do, doesn't differentiate cultures very well. It's not a very good marker for differentiating cultures. Reproduction, you know, a single sex act, if you're well, lucky or unlucky, depending on how you measure it, can result in a child. So even though we think about sex a lot, it doesn't really define different human cultures. It turns out that food is actually the thing that distinguishes different cultures, the way people get their food, whether you're, I mean, the, the, the way that we've mostly, like up until some portion of this, this ball of yarn, was foraging, or the uh, popular word for it is hunter-gatherers. And this is the way animals get their food. This is the way you know, most organisms do, is going out and find, other than plants, go out and find their food somewhere, bring it back, and eat it. So most of human history has had a strong element of foraging in it. Another way to get food is, that human beings do, is horticultural societies, gardening societies, essentially. And I'm gonna spend some time on this a little later on and look at that, because they're very interesting. And then agriculture, you know, this thing that happened after 990,000 years of human, human culture. Agricultural societies are quite different from horticultural and hunter-gatherer societies. So it's, it's very, a whole different way of getting food and it really, really reshapes your society when you get to agriculture. And then two others that are, they're really a, a subset of agriculture because you need agriculture first, but they're quite different types of civilizations, types of cultures, are pastoral cultures, which are those that move animals around uh, kind of usually nomadic, but they're, they're very, they're herding-based cultures, and they're quite different from the other sorts of cultures. And then the final one is industrial cultures, which are also a subset of agriculture. You need agriculture, you need cities and those sorts of things before you can really have an industrial culture. But those last two are kind of subsets of agriculture, even though there are strong differences between them. So these are the five basic human cultures, and they're very, very different. 
So really, you, know, you don't get civilization, you don't get cities, civis, you don't get civic life in many cases. You don't get city life until you get agriculture. And so let's look at agriculture for a little while. Here is where agriculture began. This is the Fertile Crescent, it was once called, in Iraq or ancient Mesopotamia. And looking at this now, uh, it, I mean, the, the term Fertile Crescent is really kind of a, a cruel joke at this point. That after about 2,000 or 3,000 years of agriculture there, particularly once they started irrigating, this was the result. This is what the landscape wound up looking like and still looks like that 7,000 years later. It still hasn't recovered. There are some other factors, of course, the climate has changed, but agriculture really hammered this area and it hasn't ever recovered from it. So we'll look at another place that was an early center of agriculture. This is in Greece. Uh, those of you who've been to Greece know that it's a very beautiful land. It's also very austere. It's rocky, white, a lot of sunshine, but if you, if you look back at the writings of the ancient Greeks, they describe forests everywhere and verdant hillsides and brooks streaming with crystal clear water and these delightful waterfalls and animals everywhere and this amazing green lush landscape. It only took agriculture about 500 years in Greece to completely eliminate all of that and then the Greeks had to expand their empire and that's been the pattern. Expand their empire to go look for fertile soil in many of the valleys and go into Egypt and go into Italy and places like that. So this gully is an example of you know, part of Greece. And then the Dust Bowl in the uh, Great Plains, after only about a century of agriculture, there we've been speeding up that pattern, only about a century of agriculture in the Great Plains did we wind up with pretty similar conditions of bad, badly eroded, loss of topsoil, We've managed to power ourselves out of this through oil. The oil technologies have allowed us to rebuild some of the soil. We changed our plowing techniques and those sorts of things. But the general result, pretty much the world over, with the exception of some flooding river valleys, like the way the Nile used to be before they dammed it, which in permaculture we call a type one error, to dam the source of life and stop that annual flooding that renewed the soil. But in general, agriculture, looks like it's not very sustainable anywhere except in a few major river valleys that flood everywhere. That even the Chinese who've been doing agriculture for 4,000 years have had to move from place to place to be able to do it. The, uh, the Yellow River was a major agricultural center, but its name used to be the Great River until they cut down the headlands about 800 years ago, cut down the forests to expand agriculture in there. And then it became the Yellow River because it's full of sediment now. So that's going to be a fair focus of the first part of this talk is, is there such a thing as sustainable agriculture? Can you actually do it for very long? I guess the, the question, another way I like to phrase that is, name one ecosystem that is better off for having agriculture move into it. And then the follow-up is, how long can we keep doing that? We've had about a 10,000 year run and we don't have 10,000 years more of doing this. We need to figure out what the problem is, identify the problem, and then find solutions. So what is the problem? Why does agriculture do this? And it's not, you know, I'm not going to go into topsoil loss very much and that sort of thing, all these really what I think are symptoms of fundamental problems. One of the big ones is that agriculture is a positive feedback system in terms of population. You know, the way it works is that you get more efficient food techniques, you can produce more food in a small area, and so that means you can have more people. And then more people, of course, need more food, so you need to increase the food producing area to get more food. So it's a, it's a, it's a positive spiral. You know, it, it results in more and more and more people. Another big effect on population with agriculture was that Grain is really easy to convert into calories. Meat, meat's really good for building protein. If you're a forager, you're getting a fair amount of meat and then a lot of greens and the occasional tubers. But it, and meat is really good for making protein, but it's not that good to convert into energy, to convert into calories. It's not a very efficient conversion. When an organism discovers a rich energy source, that is a trigger to breed. It says, this is a great environment. It's time to have babies. We can do it here. And that's, that's the result, is an increase in population when you get a good energy source. And grain is an outstanding 
energy source, and grain was the heart of agriculture. Another big one in triggering population growth was, is that soft foods mean you can wean children much earlier rather than waiting for your kids' teeth to develop to where they can chew meat and you know, vegetables and stuff like that. You can wean a child much earlier, and that means that the interval between pregnancies can shorten drastically because nursing mothers tend not to have children until they're done nursing. So suddenly the pregnancy cycle got way, way, way shorter when you can wean kids at a year instead of three years or four years or that sort of thing. So big population spikes. Okay, so some of the myths about agriculture. The, uh, the classic phrase from Hobbes is that the life of those savages, the people before civilization, is nasty, brutish, and short, and it turns out not to be true. Now, I don't want to tell a fairy story here and say, oh, those pre-agricultural people had it easy and life was so wonderful and all that. It, it wasn't. I mean, life, life's got its challenges however you are making your living. And pre-agricultural people or non-agricultural people have challenges too. But I want to dispel a few myths. And one of the first ones is that we discovered agriculture and our health bloomed. And it's, uh, the opposite is true. There are some amazing agriculture or archaeological sites in Turkey, uh, Abu Huraira and a bunch of others are these classic archaeological sites, and one in Illinois called Dixon Mounds, where they actually have a clear sequence of skeletal remains from pre-agriculture right into the dawn of agriculture in those sites. And what they found is that a bunch of things occur. One is the lifespan drops by about 20% or so when you move from pre-agriculture, from a foraging or horticultural society, to an agricultural society. Uh, the, the Abu Huraira site in Turkey, the average age of the foragers there was about, so the average lifespan was about 35, which has been the typical lifespan for most human beings up until the industrial age. Lifespan in the early 1800s was about 40 years or so. Suddenly, we did all sorts of things starting about 200 years ago or so that really boosted our average lifespan. But there, it wasn't like people turned 40 and they were old. It's just that most people died when they were really young and then a small percentage lived to be 60, 70, 80. But the lifespan was 35 before agriculture and then at these sites, the lifespan, average lifespan drops to 28 or 29. So it's a really big drop at that point. So people didn't live as long. Far more degenerative diseases. And this picture here, this Egyptian woman using what's called a quern, is, is one example of the degenerative diseases that occur. The way that you grind grain using one of these, it's kind of like a, a mortar and pestle, but you use a roller, and I'm going to demonstrate. There's a flat or a, uh, a, a curved piece of stone on the ground. You sprinkle your grain on it. You take this stone rolling pin, and you kneel down, and you do this for eight hours. And so particularly in women, but in, in everybody, uh, that hurts my knees, that hurts my spine, that hurts my wrists. You know, degenerative diseases, arthritic conditions in all of those joints, spinal problems, and, and just a whole raft of degenerative diseases suddenly show up in people when agriculture appears. Those of you who've read Jared Diamond's wonderful book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, know that most of our epidemic diseases come from domesticated animals. Chicken pox, okay, smallpox is a disease of cattle. Measles and, and mumps come from pigs. Swine flu, obviously. So uh, not all, but a large number of epidemic diseases come from domesticated animals. So when we started domesticating animals and living with them, epidemic diseases became much more prevalent. People got shorter at the dawn of agriculture. The average height at these sites before agriculture was five foot nine immediately after the dawn of agriculture drops to five foot five. And even in Turkey, at these pe the people who live near the former Abu Huraira site, they are just now getting back up to five foot nine with you know, meat and all the things that they're eating. So people were much shorter once we got to agriculture. And famine, this is one I want to, to hit on for a minute. We're told that you know, hunter-gatherers are hungry all the time, or they, you know, they, the famine is a regular visitor, and they're scratching out this bare little existence. 
Again, the opposite turns out to be true, that most foragers can find food under almost any conditions. They may not have a lavish feast, but they can almost always find something. Whereas in agriculture, here's a, uh, here's a little look at some of the numbers. I'm um, looking at the, the French historian Fernand Brodel, who has wrote the, some of the first popular histories. Rather than just looking at the royal people, he looked at how average people lived. And these are some of the numbers of, from, the 15th, from the 15th century up until the 18th and 19th century. Famine was a regular visitor everywhere. These are the major famines that swept across the entire continent, reducing the population by 10 to 30 percent every time they came through. And then there were local famines that were far more frequent than these. So this myth that agriculture developed, you know, we created a surplus and then everybody you know, didn't go hungry anymore, absolutely untrue when you look at the historical data. One of the big ones for agriculture, and, and this is what creates a lot of these other problems, is that there's a negative return once you begin involving it looks like animals in agriculture. Once you stop using just your own labor and you begin using animals in agriculture, which is kind of a hallmark of a lot of agriculture, is that now you have to take into account the animal's caloric intake as well as your own. If you're doing a fair accounting of how much energy it takes to get food to your table, you know, we've all heard those numbers about a potato contains 10 calories of oil for every calorie of nutrition, that kind of thing. Well, something very similar turns out to be true when you start bringing animals into agriculture. There's all this, you know, there's all this grass or whatever involved in the calories in the animal food, pigs, cattle, whatever it is that you're using for your manure, you're using for your labor. And it looks like you get a point of diminishing returns. One calorie in, one calorie out occurs right about the time you start bringing animals into, uh, into, your, into an agricultural picture. So another myth is that agricultural people have much more leisure time, and that's why culture developed. But as we've seen, culture developed before agriculture. A forager who's relatively skilled only needs about three hours to, to gather a, a full week's worth of food, whereas a farmer needs several days to produce a full week's worth of food. Farming societies are nowhere near as diverse as horticultural or hunter-gatherer societies. Farming societies kind of have recognizable things all over the world, whereas hunter-gatherer societies, I mean, the, the Khan Bushmen in Africa, oppo as opposed to the Yanomamu, opposed to the Ainuit, are way different. They're, I mean, they hardly even do the same things, much less do them differently. So the breadth of culture in foraging cultures is way more than in agricultural societies. And I think we're learning right now that there's only one way to have an industrial society. You know, there's really only one form. The McDonald's form of culture is pretty much the only one that is going to survive if, uh, if it continues the way it's going. So much less cultural diversity. The surplus that agriculture generates, which is supposedly its really cool quality, means that someone's got to guard that surplus. Someone has to protect it from being stolen. Someone controls who gets, this, who gets it distributed to. You get, so it's really the beginning of the police state at that point. You can do agriculture almost anywhere. If you are a forager, you know where your food is, you know when it comes into season, you know where the animal paths are, and, and the spirits of your life live in the place that you do. So you, you tend to stay there, not completely all the time, but you tend to remain in the same place, because if you go too far, it's different foods, different animals, you don't know the patterns. Whereas agriculture, you just move into a place, you clear it, it just needs a fairly similar climate, although once you've got irrigation and things like that, now you can move to drier or, or wetter places. So agriculture is very portable, and they're looking, they look at genetic studies and find that as agriculture spread from its, the spreading centers, like we'll take Mesopotamia as a beginning, it wasn't just agriculture that spread, it was the agriculturists that spread. Their genes moved all the way across Europe down into Africa, out into Great Britain, up north into Scandinavia. It was their genes that moved. So they, the people themselves, moved into these lands. It wasn't just their ideas that moved in. Agriculture 
uses more land than just the cropland. The cropland is just a visible footprint, but you need roughly two to three times as much land to grow the fertilizer. If you're constantly taking a yield off a piece of land, you've got to replace that yield. It's got to come from somewhere. And if it's being done sustainably, living in a solar budget, it takes two to three times as much land to grow your compost crops or your manure crops as it does to grow food. So there's a much bigger footprint of agriculture. And then you need land for the mines to smelt the metal, for, for plows and things like that, the fuel, timber, all of those. And you need land for your farm workers and for all of their needs. So the agricultural footprint is actually much bigger than it actually looks in terms of cropland. So really, I guess a, the way to think about agriculture, or one way to think about it, is that it's a way of turning ecosystems into people. Because an agricultural ecosystem, well, that's, a, that's another oxymoron. Agriculture does not support ecosystem function. You're losing soil, you're not creating anywhere near as much oxygen, you're not sequestering very much carbon dioxide, there's very little biodiversity. Farmers don't like biodiversity. I mean, in theory they do, but they're actual practices. And I know I'm beating up on farmers, and you know, I will say the old cliche, some of my best friends really are farmers. And I love farming. And I love the whole di idea of making your living on the land. And I grow a lot of food. So it really, you know, it hurt to begin finding these things and really seeing that agriculture, by definition, can't be made sustainable because this is what it does. This is a rain, former rainforest that's now being used to produce ethanol and sugar cane. So it's, agriculture is the conversion of ecosystems into people. So another piece of this is that if you're a forager and you over harvest, if you take too many deer, if you dig up too many tubers, you get feedback from that land immediately saying, you messed up, you have to slow down. Whereas with agriculture, it's actually the degradation of the ecosystem that tells you you're doing a good job. It's the conversion of the soil into your food. It's the conversion of that former forest into your food. It's the fact that you don't have varmints and critters coming around eating your food anymore that makes you think you're doing a good job. So you don't get feedback from the land fast enough. It's very slow. It's generations before you finally realize, well, this soil is pretty well played out, isn't it? And you know, I don't really hear the birds anymore. It takes a long time before you get that message. And that's too slow for us. So, okay, all this stuff happened, you know, we degraded land, and, 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 and then in the 70s came, you know, people were making these dire predictions of how millions, hundreds of millions were going to starve in the 70s and the 80s. And they turned out to be wrong because we learned how to turn oil into food. I know, you know most of you know, know that piece of the story. I just want to show you a comparison here of here's wheat yields from 1950 to 2004 or so. And you can see this semi-logarithmic or just a nice, a nice curve here. And it really matches oil production just about perfectly. And if we graph population onto this as well, we would also see a curve going just about exactly the same rate. So oil into food, oil is what, and you can see now, oil is kind of peaking and wheat production's kind of peaking. There's no coincidence that those two numbers are going hand in hand. <coughs> so that's the Green Revolution, which you know, Norman Borlaug got a Nobel Prize for, and people talk about it being a great thing. I think a lot of us have become aware that there have been some problems, like another two billion people on Earth who wouldn't have been there, and now we gotta feed them. <coughs> You know, us. So here is the Green Revolution today. This is a former Green Revolution field in India. This is the farmer standing on it. It's completely salted because of the application of fertilizer for 30 years or so. This land is never coming back. It's the only way, never in terms of you know, our lifespans, because the only way to get salt out of land like this is to flush it with enormous quantities of fresh water, or you can do deep mulches and things like that, but there's no, salt of, there's no source of mulch, and there's certainly no source of really clean fresh water here. So this, this land is out of commission for generations because of the Green Revolution. And it's not happening in as many places anymore because it's very expensive to supply the fertilizers and the pesticides and hybrid seeds and all of these things. So the 
Governments who brought in the Green Revolution run out of money in many cases and can't support it anymore. So, so much for that. So I think a lot of you are aware of the, the peak oil idea, and this is a uh, somewhat exaggerated but actually quite accurate graph of our oil consumption. And world oil consumption has been, or world oil production has been essentially flat since about 2005 in the major oil fields, the Cantarell field in Mexico, major fields in Saudi, if, if we can, you know, if the Saudis are being accurate, uh, are de de depleting at an enormous rate. The world oil production has been pretty much flat for the last five years, and we've been wanting to crank out more oil. So peak oil is really pretty much here, and all the things that that means. So we're not going to be investing a lot of oil in food much more. So here's a graph from David Holmgren, one of the co-originators of the permaculture concept that he's let me use with his four scenarios for the future. And uh, he's, you can see by his language, I think the techno fantasy, uh, he's, he's a little pejorative there, but the idea that we're, you know, we're at this, uh, this peak point and we'll, the techno fantasy is that we will discover something, a new energy source, uh, something that's comparable to oil, except maybe better, and will continue on. That raises its own set of issues about pollution and population and things like that. But um, okay, so that's one possible scenario, and I'm agreeing that it's possible. We might find something to replace oil. There's the green tech stability: is we will make this little bit of a you know kind of belt tightening, putting sweaters on, sort of transition, um, and then we'll have solar panels everywhere and wind generators and you know new technology. Will will get us out of this, and then there's the Atlantis scenario, you know, boom, um, the Doomer scenario, and the other one is the creative descent, and David has put the word permaculture on there as you know, this is this is where we may may be able to go with this. <coughs> so you know, an Earth stewardship. We're not you know living within a solar budget means a pretty good descent from where we are now. We use seven years worth of accumulated sunlight in terms of fossil fuels every day. The, the load of burning one day's worth of fossil fuels consumes seven years worth of stored sunlight. So if we're going to live within a solar budget, you do the math and it gets pretty brutal. That's, that's a really big slowing down. We've actually been through something like peak oil before in the Bronze Age. This is one of the, the uh, rising of becoming prevalent theory about why the Bronze Age ended? Because the Bronze Age, 2500 BC or so, was a pretty high civilization. Bronze is a wonderful metal, malleable, but it holds a pretty good edge. It doesn't rust. And at the end of the Bronze Age, there was about a thousand years of sort of dark ages. And then the Iron Age began. And iron is an inferior metal. Iron, not, not steel, but iron. An inferior metal to bronze. And people were saying, so how come the Bronze Age came before the Iron Age? Why did we resort to an inferior metal after we were using bronze? One of the theories is that we ran out of wood. That wood is an essential element for smelting any kind of metal if you were before coal and oil. The way that it works is that, okay, here's a plow. It weighs about a kilogram or so, a bronze plow, 2.2 pounds. And in order to make a plow like this, you dig up the ore, and to smelt the, the, uh, the metal out of it, you need about five or six of these. You need six or so cubic meters of wood to make one kilogram of bronze. And a cubic meter is, a, is about a 60-year-old tree, about that diameter or so. Taking pretty much the whole tree will give you a cubic meter. So you need five or six of those in order to smelt one kilogram of bronze. The way you do that is you stack up a whole bunch of wood and then you pile some soil on it and you set the wood on fire and you do a, a pyrolysis to it and you make charcoal out of it because the charcoal will burn at a higher temperature than wood, gotten rid of all the low, low burning volatiles. And so now you can smelt it. So you need five to six cubic meters of wood to make a kilogram of metal and they were making thousands and thousands of kilograms of all, I mean, my belt buckle here is probably, you know, one tree like that if we were to make this the traditional way using wood. So you can imagine how very quickly you would deforest, say, the island of Crete, which was the, the center of, uh, of Bronze Age civilization. 
you'd knock that down in a couple, you know, a few generations. So peak wood was something that we have already seen, where we deforested major areas in the Mediterranean, ran out of bronze, took all the low-hanging fruit in the way of the easy-to-get alloys, and that's why it took us about a thousand years to grow those forests back before we could start smelting iron again. And we did a lot of that in Europe instead of in the Mediterranean. So, okay, so we've got, uh, got major soil erosion and those sorts of things coming from agriculture. We've got toxic stuff lying around everywhere, a planet full of it. We've got our infrastructure is collapsing. You know, I, I ran into a lot of potholes driving here. I was really you know, just looking at the situation in the highways around here, not able to keep this stuff up. We've got global warming on top of that. You know, we've got a laundry list of all sorts of enormous issues following us, you know, coming up to us. Agriculture turns out to be unsustainable. I, I truly believe this. Okay, so what do we do? And so now we turn the corner. We're, we're at the nadir, and I'm going to take us up to a potential set of solutions. These are some of my favorite permaculture sites, just places where this is, stuff is being done. The, the reason that I'm bringing permaculture in is because I mentioned this idea of a horticultural society. Not forager, not agriculture, something kind of in between. And this was always thought of as a quick little moment, like a transition that we made between, you know, you're a hunter-gatherer, then you started to learn to domesticate crops, and then boom, you did agriculture. But there was a short little period where you were a horticultural society. You were gardeners, but you hadn't had farming yet. And that turns out, too, to be another myth. But, so what is a horticultural society? Just the word itself means plants. You're tending plants rather than creating fields. So really, you know, informally, it's gardening instead of farming. The tools are small hand tools rather than large power tools or even plows that are turning over large quantities of soil. You're working with hoes and digging sticks or smaller tools. The crops are generally mixed and they're generally on a small scale. A horticulturist might have a little patch of corn or wheat or something like that but they're, they're growing things in polyculture for the most part. A big one here is that agriculture is the setting back of succession to the annual weed stage. That's one of the very first stages of this pattern of succession. Most land where there's enough water wants to become, enough rainfall wants to become forest. A forest ecosystem is a much more highly developed successionary phase with far more biodiversity, far more productivity, far more complexity, and agriculture sets that back to its initial stage. I mean, agriculture is clear-cutting every year, right? You clear-cut your fields to do agriculture. Whereas horticulture encourages, you know, we forest garden in horticulture. We grow tree crops. So that allows the ecosystems to continue to function if you are doing good horticulture. You've got biodiversity and you're welcoming it because you need those pollinators and you need those critters bringing in interesting new seeds from other places. So all of those ecosystem functions that are wiped out in agriculture can be retained when you're doing horticulture. And horticultural societies tend to have much less hierarchy in them. When they've analyzed them, usually the, the chief or the big man, as the anthropologists call it, which is an interesting phrase, but uh, is someone who's immediately accessible. You know, go ahead and try to talk to Obama. Right? Our, our systems are so hierarchical, I and mean, you probably can't even get in to see the mayor, much less. I mean, maybe this is a cool town where you can, but in many places you can't. So in, in horticultural and forager societies, the, the head person is very accessible, and they tend to rule through charisma and personal force rather than through having a staff and a military around to keep everybody at bay. One of the, the whole thing that actually got me started on this whole train of thought was, it's not as true as it used to be because permaculture is reaching a much larger audience now, but when I was first teaching permaculture courses, almost all of my students, even though they were from a Judeo-Christian, usually background, like, like most Americans are, um, they were pagan, Wiccan, earth, goddess worshiper types, or at least their, you know, their whole philosophy was much more in earth spirits. And I kept wondering, you know, why are all these pagans coming to my courses? And, and my, own, you know, my own tendency had moved more that way. I was raised Episcopalian, but 
you know, I, I much more think about mother nature and things like that. So I was wondering why. Forager societies and horticultural societies tend to have spiritual beliefs that are right here on earth. Their spirits are here. Agricultural societies, not all of them, but most of them, tend to place their deity in the sky, not on earth. Up there, heaven's up there somewhere, God is up there somewhere, and human beings in, in almost all agricultural societies are the chosen. God has chosen us for a special role, you know, in Christianity it's, <coughs> or the Judeo-Christian faith, it's we have dominion or, or stewardship, if you want to use a nicer word for it, over other creatures. In horticultural and forager societies, we're just one critter and all the others have spirit, all the others are just as important as we are and we're in an interconnected set of relationships with them. So it's a much, again, flatter hierarchically, hierarchy spiritually as well. So that, that started me thinking. So, so uh, it made me realize that a lot of people doing permaculture are doing this conscious or unconscious movement toward a horticultural society rather than an agricultural society. So I think I've made the point fairly well that culture does not necessarily require agriculture. And one of the groundbreaking pieces, very controversial piece of work done in the 1960s was an article called The Original Affluent Society by Marshall Salins. Still pretty controversial, but he was one of the first ones to point out that horticulturalists and foragers work a lot less than farmers. They work three or four hours a day, and then they hang around and talk for the rest of the day. <laughs> Sounds okay to me. They have art and music and all of these things that we consider part of a, you know, a high culture, highly developed community, rituals, all of that. So you don't need agriculture to have culture. So this would be you know, a society where ecosystems get to function rather than us converting ecosystems into us. So how do we do that? You know, what does that look like? How can we begin to make this transition to where, because I, you know, like I say, I don't think we've got 10,000 more years, probably not even a century doing what we're doing. Yet horticultural societies have a long track record and I think they can become truly sustainable. If not forever, then at least for, you know, it might give us a break for 100,000 years or so while we actually figure it out. So how do we do that? Permaculture is a design system based on observing nature and developing a set of principles that are in harmony and allowing the ecological functions to all occur while still keeping a place for human beings in it as well. And this is an example of regenerative design. It's one of the first ones. It's a little homey and funky looking. But this is a site in Northern California where the, the idea was there was an area on this, it's the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center uh, in Sonoma County. They had a place where the soil was really eroding badly. <coughs> it had been uh, used for grapevines for a long time. Nasty soil where, rushing away and the, the woods right behind it was terribly uh, fire burdened. It was full of lots of skinny little dead poles, really overgrown, it was second growth forest, terrible fire hazard, and then really bad erosion right next to it in the soil. They wanted to put up a little building there and they wanted to use the building project to leave the land in better shape than it had been in before that construction project got there. Usually you look at any construction project and the land's a mess around it, right? This, what they really wanted to do was use this project to heal <coughs> this land and leave it in better shape. So they went into the forest, they removed a lot of the dead trees and poles from it, so they thinned the forest to reduce the fire burden. The poles were used as the uprights in the building, and the small branches were used to weave kind of wattle and daub types of walls together. And those were then plastered over with the the clay, the clay soil that came out of from the pond that they dug on the site and the swales that were running across the, these uh, kind of these trenches that are designed on contour to stop erosion. The soil that came from these, these basins, these trenches, was then used as the plaster and the, the mud infill on the building. The grasses that they harvested, the native grasses, removed the exotic grasses, harvested the seed heads from the native grasses, and then used the straw from the grasses as insulation in the building 
and on and on and on. They, they, and then they planted the native seeds back in the soil and grew the meadow back that was there. So it's stopping erosion, reducing the fire burden, creating native habitat, and creating a nice little artist retreat place where they're visiting scholars and writers come to stay. And it's all built with either locally sourced materials, nothing in it came from further than 150 miles away. Uh, the bamboo in it in these trusses here was the most distant material. The rest came almost exclusively from on site, except for some salvaged materials like the car window that you can, the windshield, it's up there in the, in the building. So really an attempt at regenerative design, something to leave the site in better shape than it was before. So des design and act regeneratively. Another one, a permaculture principle, is make the least changed for the greatest effect. Find the leverage points. Danella Meadows has this wonderful article that came out a number of years ago called Places to Intervene in a System. Identifying the places where a little bit of work will do you a huge amount of good. And this is an example from Portland where there was a very busy intersection. Well, actually, it was, it was a side street that was being used by cars to cut through because the busy street nearby was crowded, and so cars would cut through the neighborhood. The neighbors were all really concerned about their kids getting hit. They went to the city and said, we're getting all this side traffic coming through. We want, to build a, we want you to put in a traffic circle. And the city said, <coughs> that, okay, there are two ways to get a traffic circle. One is you give us $10,000, we'll build you a traffic circle. The other way is that if someone gets killed in the intersection, we will build a traffic circle there. So none of the neighbors were willing to volunteer for option two. And so they, they went to the Department of Transportation. They had this idea that someone had done somewhere else once before. And they went to the Department of Transportation and said, we want, well, I'll, I'll shorten the story. On when, in my urban workshop, I'll tell the full story. They painted the intersection with a sunflower pattern. And they put kiosks on each of the four corners, because all four of the neighbors were into this. It immediately slowed traffic down. It became a focal point for the city. The mayor came by and looked at it because the Department of Transportation was saying, they vandalized this intersection. They painted the street without a permit. And the mayor came and looked at it and said, wait a minute, you're slowing traffic. You're creating community because the families are all out here. It's a much safer neighborhood. You're probably increasing property values. You're reducing insurance costs because there isn't going to be as much theft and there won't be as many car accidents here. I named several other ticked off other things that were in line with Portland's mission statement for the things they want to see happening in the city. And she said, and this isn't costing the city a thing? Okay, let's create an ordinance so people can do this other places. So this one act of painting the street did all this stuff that then rippled through. So of course, the first thing that happens when you paint the street is you have a great big party in the street, because <laughs> now the place is a safe place to hang out. And then several of the other neighbors said, ooh, this is really cool, and I'd like to have a mosaic on my ugly concrete wall here at the intersection so that it looks like it's part of it. And then a local artist made an incredible trellis that was in the same pattern as the sunflower head in the middle of the intersection. And they hung up that and grew grapes on it. And so this whole thing just zoomed out across, across you know, spread across the whole set of intersections. Okay, another permaculture principle, I've just got a few more minutes left, so I'm going to zip through these guys here, <coughs> is there are all these things flowing by us all the time. Energy, you know, solar energy, wind energy, water energy, social energy, all of these things moving through us all the time. Catch them, store them, and use them to create even more catchments and storage systems. So this was a project I was involved in in the Bahamas. I got to teach down there a couple times. It was really fun. It's a, it's a design school that's out on a little peninsula. They couldn't put in a conventional septic system for the hundred or so students that are down there because it's, it's on coral and the, the effluent, the waste would just go straight into the ocean. A septic system wouldn't work. So they designed a system that started with a septic tank and then had these two lagoons that the, um, the slurry, let's call it something polite, the, the effluent from the septic tank would go into these two concrete lagoons that you can see there. And they filled the lagoons full of broken up coral, which is their form of kind of poor pumice or vermiculite or that kind of thing, gravel in other words, and planted all these native plants in it. And this is what it looked like right after it was planted. Then they started flushing the toilets into it. So we've got 100 people or so using toilets, flushing it into this enclosed basin. And that's what it looked like the day it was planted. 
that's what it looked like three months after it was planted. <laughs> so, you know, you're pumping water and nitrogen, nutrients into it, and it's got plenty of sunlight, so it's very, very happy. So there's three months after it was planted. This is three years after it was planted, okay? So this is, you know, nasty stuff being turned into something incredibly beautiful. What's really fun here is that uh, the, the funders for the school, the, the donors are like Yale trustees and very wealthy people from, from New England. They came down for a tour and we gave them a tour of the place and they, uh, they'd walk up through the center here to this palapa and then they'd come down in the trail and we'd stop here and then we'd explain what was going on. And they, you know, and there's no smell. I mean, it's gorgeous. There are butterflies and birds in it and they're looking around going, oh, that, that's really disgusting. Oh, it's so beautiful. But it's, oh, but that's, you know, it's, it's amazing. Just this, I mean, this is stuff that's going by all the time. Catch it, use it to make something beautiful. So models, you know, who's doing horticultural societies right now? The Amazon, turns out that the, the forest composition in huge portions of the Amazon is not what you would think looking at statistics. It doesn't have the species distribution that you would think of just a random set of species. Far more food producing plants, far more nitrogen fixing plants, far more timber species in it than a random assemblage of plants would have. So the Amazon's been tweaked by people for a long time so that humans can be there and have a good time there. And yet the Amazon is one of the nicest, most functional ecos. It's the lungs of the planet. And yet people have tweaked it. So a, a site of horticultural societies. <coughs> the uh, temperate zones, the most of the East Coast, there's stories, okay, that most of the East Coast, the Mississippi Valley, the major <coughs> valleys in California, most of the low-lying areas in this country were food forests before the Europeans got here. And you know, the major species in, uh, in a lot of New England and the East Coast before Europeans got here, walnuts, chestnuts, hickory nuts, beech nuts, you know, white oak, which is an excellent edible. The white oak is the best of the acorns to eat. It doesn't contain tannins. Uh, it make a really good meal out of it. And the people who tended that for food forest were exterminated. The food forest kind of fell apart. So when folks like Emerson and Thoreau and those guys who were writing about the, the tangled, dark, scary forest primeval, you know, in the 1800s with a wilderness, what they were looking at was a food forest that had had a couple centuries to degrade and become this kind of nasty thicket at that point. So this, this is we can create these wonderful ecosystems where there's tons of food for us and yet you know the reports of naturalists in the early early days of you know the birds that would take days for a flock to fly by and salmon so thick that you could walk across the river and yet people were using those lands and and modifying them enormously horticultural societies so some examples of horticultural societies the hopewell people who lived in pennsylvania and new jersey were there for about 4,000 years as a horticultural society. That's pretty, pretty good to be in the same place for 4,000 years. Mound builders, so they, they were mound builders. Here's a site in New Jersey uh, that's, that's one of the Hopewell Mounds. These folks had great art. You know, they did beautiful, beautiful work, a very high culture, but they were horticultural. They grew a little bit of corn, but tended several hundred species of other plants and had great habitat there. A few more examples, the Northwest Coast, uh, primarily horticultural and forager people. Ancient Oaxaca, they had some corn, but they also had hundreds of species grown in polycultures in their dooryard gardens. Uh, the Nuwa'alu in, in Indonesia are a horticultural society that's been there for thousands of years. The Owens Valley Paiute and the Kumaya'e in, in California are two peoples who were there for thousands of years as gardeners. Not farmers, they weren't doing big scale crops, they were gardeners and doing some hunting, but they were there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years living sustainably. So the idea that horticulture is this short little transition period in between foraging and farming is not true. It is a stable way for human beings to reside on the planet and make a really good life and yet allow other ecosystems to function. So a couple of models, I'll buzz through these very quickly. The Bullock Brothers on Orcas Island have a 25-year-old food forest that has 
so much food in it. When I show up there to teach, when there are 50 students up there, Doug Bullock comes to me and says, Toby, your job is to eat 10 plums a day for the next three weeks. So everybody at the whole course, 50 people eating thousands of plums, and there's still tons of food there at the end of the course. Uh, the Regenerative Design Institute in Marin County, Penny Livingston's place, uh, another example of, of a fairly well-established horticulture, permaculture site. So when I got into this stuff, permaculture, about 15 years ago, or really 20 years ago, I really thought it was, you know, I, I thought it was, it was kind of a hobby, I guess, kind of like gardening. You know, I liked it. I thought it was a cool idea. I liked systems thinking. And oh, look, here's a way to do systems thinking and garden at the same time. I, you know, really, really found it very attractive. So it was kind of like a hobby. And over the years, though, I realized, I mean, this is actually a little more important than just a hobby. You know, we, we need to be doing things like this. We need these kinds of transitions, not back. We don't go backwards. We're not going to go back to foragers or back to what the type of horticulture people used to do. But we need to move into something where we understand the teachings of these horticultural societies. And we're, we're starting to make that transition, the fact that this room is full of people right now. You know, I'm some guy from the West Coast, and you all showed up here, you know, with the potential of snow and all of that. It shows what the interest is. You know, it shows that there are lots of us starting to do this here. So we, this is something that we need to do, and it's going to make a huge difference, and it's not just a hobby anymore. And I'm very grateful to all of you for having come here to do this. And I hope this is giving you some tools and some ideas. I hope to see as many of you as possible at these workshops over the weekend. And I want to thank you all very, very much for coming here. I'm very grateful. <laughs>